Hey everyone, I think we're going to get started. So today we're very happy to host Dr. Larry Young for our Pioneers in Biomedical Research series. Uh, Dr. Young is currently the director of several centers, including the Center for Translational Social Neuroscience and the NIMH-funded Conte Center for Oxytocin and Social Cognition, uh, both at Emory University. He's also the director for the Center for Social Neural Networks in Tsukuba, Japan, where he spends about a month every year doing research. He is currently the chief of the Division of Behavioral Neuroscience and Psychiatric Disorders in the Yerkes National Primate Research Center at Emory. And he holds the William P. Timmy Professorship in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory. He has a similar number of affiliations as we do here. <laughs> Um, Dr. Young was born and raised in Georgia and received his Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Georgia. He did his PhD in Zoology uh, at the University of Texas, Austin with Dr. David Cruz. Uh, and then he made his way to Emory um, for his postdoctoral training with Dr. T uh, Tom Insel, which many of us uh, recognize as the previous director of NIMH. Uh, and he's remained at Emory since. So Dr's Young, Dr. Young's research focuses on the molecular, cellular, and neurobiological basis of social behaviors. Uh, he uses a number of animal models to study social behaviors, including uh, the monogamous prairie voles and the how to study uh, social pair bonding. Um, he has really pioneered uh, and illuminated the, royal, the roles of oxytocin and vasopressin signaling uh, in regulating social behaviors, and uh, which obviously has important implications for psychiatric disorders where social cognition is disrupted, such as uh, autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. So he's been recognized with several awards, for this work, I'll only mention a couple because his CV is nearly 60 pages long. Uh, he was awarded the Frank A. Beach Award for the, from the Society for Behavioral Neuroendocrinology, or SBN, for outstanding contributions in the field of behavioral neuroendocrinology. He's also received the Daniel H. Efron Research Award for Excellence in the Basic um, Research for Pharmacology from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. These are all mouthfuls. Uh, he was elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences in 2009 uh, and the American Academy for Arts and Sciences in 2014. He successfully mentored over um, 100 trainees um, from all levels and was recently awarded the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Mentoring Award in 2017. He's been extremely successful in obtaining extramural NIH funding. He currently has three, three R01s and R21 in addition to his P50 Center grant. He's authored nearly 200 articles and reviews, uh, in addition to a book entitled The Chemistry Between Us, Love, Sex, and the Science of Attraction, which is obviously very on theme for today's Valentine's Day. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Young. We very much uh, look forward to your talk. Okay, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me here to talk about uh, our work, and happy Valentine's Day. All right. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, the work that we've been doing at Emory for the past 25 years now um, on the neurobiology of social relationships. And uh, just to give you a little background of why I'm interested in this, I, hey. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in South, in South Georgia and uh, always you know, had animals around me, and I was very interested in the, the fact that different species of animals are born with instructions that somehow give it a brain that makes them behave in the way that that species is supposed to do. To behave. They know who to mate with, how to attract a mate, and all these kinds of things. And sort of that instructions has to be somehow encoded into the DNA. So there must be some linear sequence of information that gives rise to these brains. But there's also some mechanism to give rise to diversity in that. There's mutations, random mutations that give rise to different sets of instructions that gives diversity in behavior. And sort of, so that was, that's the sort of backdrop of my interest, you know. How do you get molecular changes in DNA that then changes the brain that then gives rise to diversity in behavior? And um, so why do I study social behavior? Because in animals, social behavior is one of the phenotypes that really varies across different species. So there's a lot of, a lot of species diversity in social behavior. But also you can look at within a species, you know, look at dogs and different kinds of social behavior that different strains of dogs have. They're all the same species. So you've got a lot of intra-species variability as well. So now if we think about our relationships, so this picture shows some of the strongest kinds of relationships and bonds that we have as humans. And uh, some of these are evolutionarily very ancient, and so you might imagine that you know, they're present across all species, that the biology underlying that behavior may be the same across species. So for example, if you look at this bond that occurs between a mother and an infant, 
That is something that you see across all mammal species. In all mammals, the mothers uh, nurture the offspring and form a, they form a strong kind of relationship. But there's this other kind of bond that humans have that's actually kind of rare among mammals at least. Uh, that's the, the bond that occurs between mates. This romantic relationship, it's what we call love, is something that it's actually it's very, pretty uncommon. In 95 to 97 percent of species, males and females come together, they mate. After mating, they split. The female raises the offspring by themselves. The male just spends his time looking for other females. Okay, but in 3% that, of species that we call socially monogamous, the male and female actually, after mating, something happens and they, they prefer to be with that other individual. They develop a bond. And so um, I'm interested in understanding how that behavior evolved and what is the neurochemistry underlying that behavior. Now, if you want to learn something about the molecules and circuits and the neurobiology of uh, social behaviors in humans, you can learn a little bit by putting people in a brain scanner and looking at what brain areas are activated, but you can't really get very far with that. It's only correlational. If you want to get down to the mechanisms and understand, you know, especially the biochemistry of this, you need an animal model, and these are the animals that I study. These are called prairie voles, and they're different from rats and mice in the sense that these guys, like people, form these family units. In the wild, uh, uh, so they're from the Midwestern United States mostly. A male will court a female, and uh, if he's successful at, at courting that female and she likes him, she will allow him to mate. And when they mate, something special happens in the brain of both of them so that after that point, they want to spend the rest of their life together. They nest together. They raise their offspring together. Now, they may not be 100% faithful all the time, right? They cheat sometimes. But the point, what we're studying here is this, the fact that they, they form this bond, that they stay together, okay? Now, uh, other species don't do this, okay? Not only are they, the, the, do they form these bonds, they're also very highly social. They crave social contact, so that's, that's another thing about them. So we can bring them into the laboratory and study them. Now, thinking about evolution, you know, so this is a derived behavioral phenotype, right? Uh, most other rodent species don't form these bonds. You wouldn't see a male and female sitting together like this. Um, um, so I like to think about how this evolved. How, does, how, does, how do random mutations give rise to brain structures that give rise to this new, what seems to be a very ordered kind of behavior? That seems to me very difficult. But I think actually evolution takes a very easy way out in that it uses the systems that are already present to do other things that are similar. So, for example, I told you that in all species you have this uh, uh, bonding uh, mechanism so that mothers bond with their, their offspring. And I think that that same mechanism, which is present in all species, has been tweaked a little bit to be able to give rise to bonding in other situations as well. Okay? And I'll show you why I think that. And it all really comes down to um, this idea originated from this molecule's role in pair bonding. So this is oxytocin. Oxytocin is neuropeptide produced in the hypothalamus, and it is known for its role in causing birth. Oxytocin means quick birth in Greek. Um, it causes uterus contractions when it's released from the pituitary, and in fact, women who get induced into labor are getting oxytocin, the same molecule. So after the baby is born and the baby nurses, the breast stimulation that happens when the, when the infant uh, stimulates, you know, nurses, uh, causes oxytocin to, neurons to fire, oxytocin spikes in the blood, binds to receptors in the breast, causes the milk ejection reflex. Okay, so it's essential for birth. But what we also know is that when it's released into the brain, when the mother is nursing, when she has her baby, it's transforming her uh, brain and her behavior so that she thinks that that baby is the most special thing in the world and she wants to take care of that baby. Okay, how do we know that? Again, this started out with studies in animals. Uh, some of the first studies were done in rats. So um, you guys know, if you take a virgin female rat and put babies in its cage, what happens to them? They get eaten. They, the female, a virgin female doesn't like babies, right? They're annoying. It's just like, you know, if you're flying across country and there's a baby a few seats away on the plane, that baby is annoying. It squeals, you know. And that's why that's a female rat thinks about these babies, too. Um, but when she goes through the hormones of pregnancy, she experiences the estrogen, the progesterone, the fallen progesterone, the oxytocin, the other molecules that are involved. Suddenly, that same thing that was once very aversive, annoying, becomes irresistible. 
So there was an experiment done in the 60s where they take female rats and they could teach them to press a lever to get babies to come down a chute. And if the female had, had gone through pregnancy herself, she would press a lever to get hundreds of babies to come down the chute. She loved those little babies. Okay? And oxytocin is a part of that because a court Peterson showed in around 1980 that if you, 79, 80, if you take female rats and you inject them into the brain with CSF and show them pups, they don't like the pups. These are virgin females. But if you infuse oxytocin into the brain, suddenly that same stimulus becomes attractive. They go over, they nurture those pups. So oxytocin plays some role in motivation to nurture. Now, rats, uh, they are, we call them promiscuously maternal. They'll take care of any baby. They don't bond with their babies. That's because they have a nest. They have babies in that nest, so they're pretty sure all those babies are theirs. But if you take a, a sheep who lives in a herd, and everybody gives birth at the same time, there's a breeding season, you know, you not only have to think lambs are adorable, but you have to bond with your particular lamb, and that's what they do. When the female gives birth, after his birth, she looks at her baby, she smells her baby, and then she bonds with that baby, and from then on, she will nurture that baby, but not other babies. And that also seems to be oxytocin dependent. Uh, Barry Caverne and Keith Kendrick showed around the same time, 1980, that if you take a female that hasn't given birth and you give her an injection of oxytocin and show her a lamb, she will bond with that lamb. Okay, there are changes in the way her brain perceives the odor of that lamb um, that have been identified. So oxytocin is important for this mother-infant bonding. And that's what gave us the idea that it might also be involved in the pair bonding that happens between these voles. So how do we study pair bonding? We have this test. It's called the partner preference test. It's a three-chambered apparatus. And uh, we basically put the animals together. We can extend how long they're together. We can let them mate, prevent them from mating, do viral vector manipulations, optogenetics, or whatever we want to do there. And then we give them a choice to see who they want to spend the time with. So we're, I'm pretending like we're testing the female here. We have the male partner is tethered to this side. We have a novel male on this side. And then we just watch her for three hours and see who she spends her time with. And what we find is that if the animals mate, then they will have a preference for their partner and spend um, more than twice as much time with the partner than the stranger. And this is a little video. In this case, the, the male, there's a male in the middle. He spent last night with this female. He's never seen this female before. And then we're going to see how he behaves differently towards those two. So if this was a mouse or any other species, which, male, which female do you think the male would choose? The new one, the novel females. Males like novelty. But, so what, see what happens here. So he mated with this other female on this side. He's going to go over and check out this female. And not only does he have a preference for his partner, he actually now shows some aggression towards females that are not his. Hey, you're not my, fem my partner. Stay away. And then he's going to go and he's going to interact with his partner. And you can see it's a very different kind of behavior. And so you, imagine, you can imagine it's easily quantifiable. We, we do... Uh, 12 cages like this at a time with video cameras that are 16 cages at a time. That will, um, so we can do large cell scale kind of experiments. So with this kind of thing, uh, just before I started working with the voles, uh, Tom Ensel and Sue Carter did this experiment where they took animals and either uh, in, uh, gave them an infusion of oxytocin into the brain uh, and, but did not let them mate. So they were just co-housed together and they experienced oxytocin. And what they found is that if they give them oxytocin, they would, most of them would show a partner preference. So they could make them form this partner preference or this pair bond by infusing oxytocin. Okay, so that's sort of a kind of a powerful chemical, right? It can create bonds. Um, they also showed that if you block oxytocin receptors and allow them to mate, um, they will not form a bond. So this is control CSF, they mate. Most of them form bonds, but if you block that oxytocin receptor signaling, they don't form bonds. Right? So this shows that some, something about mating causes oxytocin release and then allows them to form bonds. Now, um, I got very interested in this system as a grad student looking for a postdoc position because uh, I realized that not all voles are the same. These are prairie voles that I've been talking about, but there's also metal voles. They look the same. They're genetically very similar. Uh, they come from a little bit different environment. And per, uh, whereas prairie voles are very highly social, these guys are solitary. They prefer to be by themselves. So their brain is organized in a way that does not make them want to interact with others necessarily. They, they mate, they fight, but they don't do this huddling kind of thing. And they don't form bonds whatsoever. So I was interested in what's different in the brains of these animals that 
can form these bonds um, versus ones who don't. One, the ones that are, crave social interactions versus the ones that don't. And since oxytocin is involved in that pair bonding process, we thought, well, maybe prairie voles have more oxytocin than meadow voles. So if you stain the brain and stain for oxytocin, the peptide, you'll see exactly the same amount of peptide. Right? Makes sense. They both have to give birth. They both have to feed the babies. They both have to do a lot of things. But, um, so what's different? Well, it turns out if you do a technique called receptor autoradiography so that you can see where the receptors are, for oxytocin, you see very big differences between these two species. So this is a, a slice through the prairie vole brain. You've got prefrontal cortex here, nucleus accumbens. The dark area is showing you where the receptors are. And you can see that prairie voles have a lot of receptors in the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. Metal voles have very few. Yep? No, they have different numbers of chromosomes. And we tried to make them. They're just not very interested in each other. They don't smell right or something. I'm not sure. Um, actually, prairie vole babies are born with little teeth, milk teeth. So that after they're born, they bite to the nipple, and then they don't let go. So you can hold a mom up, and she's got all of her babies hanging down. Okay. Um, the metal voles don't have that. So even at early this early stage of development, there's differences in attachment to the mom, and the metal vole mom abandons the babies after two weeks. The babies survive, but, you know, so they just have a lot of differences in the social behavior. And so this is a one, one brain receptor difference that uh, may be related to that. I think it is, I'm pretty sure it is related to that, because if you block oxytocin receptors, either in the prefrontal cortex or in the nucleus accumbens, the animals will mate, but they will not form a bond. So those receptors are important. If you knock those receptors out with siRNA viral vectors, they also do not form a bond. Okay, so it's not necessary for mating, but it is necessary for this bond that occurs afterwards. Now, nucleus accumbens, that's part of the mesolimbic dopamine reward pathway. This is an area that's involved in addiction. This is where cocaine acts to increase dopamine concentration. Okay, so this area that is involved in addiction now has lots of oxytocin receptors. And oxytocin is released during mating and social interactions and things like that. So maybe it suggests that Bonding is kind of like an addiction. Love is an addiction. What about other species? You know, marmosets are monogamous primates. Okay, they have oxytocin receptors predominantly in the nucleus accumbens. Okay, if you look at rhesus macaques, which are primates that don't form bonds, they don't have receptors there at all. So this is kind of cool that these receptors seem to be able to move around across different species and give them different behavioral phenotypes, different social behavioral phenotypes. What about people? Depends on the person. So we don't have nice images like the brains that I just showed you, but if you, this is transcriptomics data from the GTX database uh, where they took uh, from the different brain regions and did trend, uh, you know, sequ RNA sequencing. And if you look at the oxytocin, the nucleus accumbens, the same area that I was just telling you about, there's also lots of oxytocin receptors there in humans. It's one of the highest density areas, but there's a lot of individual variation in how much is there. Okay, and keep that, remember that. That's going to come up again later. So there's not only species differences in receptor expression there, but there's individual variation in receptor expression there. Um, and sort of going back to evolutionary perspective, you know. Um, there are certain aspects of human sexuality that's very different from all the other mammal species. And I think that human sexuality has evolved to be able to activate this uh, maternal bonding circuitry to create bonds between lovers, okay? Uh, so uh, for most other animals, females only mate when, it's, when they're fertile. Rats only mate when they're ovulating. Cats only mate when they come into heat. Um, but for, for human females, it's, there's been some uh, not so tightly regulated by fertility. Um, but also, we're the only species where um, nurse, or, uh, sorry, breast stimulation, the, the breast has become sexualized, right? So no other mammal species does stimulation of the breast or attraction to the breast have anything to do with sexuality. And so that, the fact that breast stimulation happens during human sexuality may be sort of a way to sort of help activate this oxytocin system uh, that would help strengthen the bond between the partners. Okay. So 
So human sexuality recapitulates the physiology of physiological stimuli, stimuli of birth and nursing. Vaginal cervical stimulation and breast stimulation happens when a mother gives birth, but also during human sexuality. But oxytocin's role is, goes beyond just mother-infant bonding and bonding between partners. Um, there's evidence that oxytocin is also involved in the bonds between humans and their dogs. Okay, when a dog looks at a human, the owner, right, he looks at their owner for an extended amount of time, uh, then that causes oxytocin release in the owner. If you give the dog oxytocin, the dog looks at the owner more, and then that causes release of oxytocin in the dog. Okay, so um, there's evidence that during the domestication of dogs, um, somehow the, this way of eye communication that, that happens uh, um, in humans, dogs adapted that, and um, we selected for that, and um, maybe that's sort of why we take care of them, we have that bond with them, it's because of the system. If you look at wolves that were raised by people exactly the same way as a dog is raised, the wolves do not look at the person in the eye. They don't use eye-to-eye -eye communication. So we have selected for dogs to use the same kind of communication that we can relate to, and then we take care of them. So what does oxytocin do? So if you Google oxytocin, I can guarantee you, you'll come up, come to the conclusion that oxytocin is the cuddle hormone, or the love hormone, or maybe even the moral molecule. Okay, But I want to tell you what I think oxytocin really does, because I think it's important to have a better understanding than just this quick uh, news story thing. So the first clues came when we started working with oxytocin knockout mice and oxytocin receptor knockout mice. So they don't form bonds. So this is not about bonding, but we wanted to see which, what, what is their phenotype. And the one phenotype that struck us as very interesting is that if mice don't have oxytocin or oxytocin receptors, they have social amnesia. That means they can't remember other mice that they've met before. So this is the results of social recognition test. If you take a mouse and you expose them to another mouse and you quantify when they meet, how much time do they spend sniffing around the head, the anogenital area, you do it again, again, and again. In wild-type mice, you see a decline, a habituation. They get bored with the same animal. You give them a new animal, they investigate more. But if you look at wild knockouts, they don't have oxytocin. Each time they meet them, it's like they've met them for the first time. right? So you probably experience this when you go to a conference or something. There's lots of people there. You meet someone and um, you can't remember if you know this person or not. They look familiar, you know. Um, well, remember that. I'm going to finish it in a minute. But if you take these mice, these knockout mice, and you, because it could be that they can't smell or they can't form memories. But if you take the, the stimulus animal and scent them with lemon scent or almond scent, a non-social scent, they can remember that. So they can remember non-social cues, something easy. It's, but they can't use the odor. Mice tell each other apart by odor. They can't use the odor that's unique to each mouse to remember the mouse. Now back to this conference, if you go to a conference, you see someone, they look familiar, but you can't remember who they are. But if you look at their name tag and you see that non-social cue, it's not their face, but now it's you know John Henry, then you can remember everything about them and their family and all the stuff, right? So if you use non-social cues, cues you can remember. So we use different parts of the brain for processing social information and non-social information. Okay? So we're very good at looking at faces and remembering those faces and seeing what's different between all of those. We're not very good at looking at penguins and telling penguins apart. But penguins are very good at telling each other apart. Right? They, they form bonds too. Um, so it's a very special thing that we use. So it's processing of social information. So what oxytocin does it makes social cues more salient, makes the brain pay attention to social information. Now, um, it increases the signal of noise. So this is uh, data from olfactory bulb, but there's data in other brain areas as well that suggests a similar kind of thing. Uh, so this is in a relation to that social uh, invest, uh, recognition. What happens in the olfactory bulb is when, when the animals meet another animal, oxytocin is released. It binds to oxytocin receptors in the anterior olfactory nucleus that has excitatory input onto granule cells. Granule cells in the olfactory bulb are inhibitory, and they quieten down the noise so that when the signal comes through, it's much clearer. So here is like the uh, sort of the neural activity in the olfactory bulb before oxytocin, and then oxytocin comes, you silence the noise, the signal comes through. So I think of it as like a television screen when there's a lot of static, 
if there's an image back there. The image is there, but it's hard to, to see it with the static. If you could turn a knob and make all the static go away, the signal comes through more clearly. And that's what's happening when oxytocin is released, okay? And it happens at the olfactory bulb, but it happens also other parts of the brain. It allows that social information to flow across the brain um, so that you use that social information. So oxytocin is not just a cuddle hormone. It is involved in the perception of social stimuli. We know from work in other labs, as well as my lab, that oxytocin is not the only molecule involved in pair bonding. You also have dopamine. If you block dopamine D2 receptors, the animals mate, but they don't form pair bonds. Uh, if you block the opiate system, the animals mate, but they don't form pair bonds. So um, there's multiple molecules that seem to be involved in this process. Uh, you might notice that a couple of those are also involved in addiction. Again, this is the addiction process, and maybe it, love is addiction to a partner. Um, and this is, this is what I imagine is happening. It's my brain model of what's going on when an animal mates and then forms a bond. Let's first pretend like this, this, is, a, this is the brain of a rat, a male rat. He's never mated before. He's not monogamous. Okay? But you take a male rat and you put him in a cage with a female who's an estrus. At first he's aroused. He knows he should do something but doesn't quite know what to do. Um, and then eventually he's successful and he mates. And when he mates, somatosensory stimulation from the genitals comes up and activates VTA, ventral tegmental area, where dopamine is made. That releases the dopamine into the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens, this reward system, and that's rewarding. The, the rat says, wow! And we know that for rats, sex is rewarding because a male rat, for example, will press a lever many times to get a female rat to drop out of the ceiling. Okay? That rat says, wow, that was great. Next, he learned from that. That dopamine helped him learn from that. And the next time he comes across a female in estrus, he's much quicker. The latency to intermission is much lower because he's learned from that. And then he spends the rest of his life trying to reactivate this circuit with other females. His brain has learned. Females are good. Right? Same thing happens in females. Males are good. Okay? Um, but what, are, what about prairie voles? They have the same sort of thing going on, but they also, uh, when they're mating, they're having that olfactory input coming into the amygdala and it's being processed to the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus of Cummins. You have oxytocin released. The oxytocin is, in, is involved in individual recognition. So that prairie vole says, wow, who is that? Who is the individual? Okay. So this is another way to visualize it. These are rats. They're not monogamous. They're going to mate. The brain is associating, if this is a male rat brain, he's associating the mating, the pleasure, the reward of mating with the female scent, which is different from a male scent. And his brain learns female scents are rewarding. Females become inherently rewarding to that male. Males are not. Uh, whereas you take a, a prairie vole brain when the animals are mating, um, they're also taking in that information, but their brain is making the association of the scent of the individual, not just the female, but which female. Right? So I think that the pair bond is actually basically somehow the hard wiring of the identity of the partner into the reward system. And it happens basically the same way in males and in females. And you know, if you're interested in learning more about this, I published a, a nice review uh, in Nature Reviews Neuroscience that puts in together lots of different brain areas, things that are involved in social identity, like social engrams, whereas the, the, the encoding of the individual, things that like valence and lots of other things going on. So if you're interested, take a look at this, this paper. Um, one of the, the things about voles, you know, when you're working with mice, you can uh, pretty quickly do dreads and cell type specific manipulations and all this kind of stuff. But in voles, it's a little bit more difficult. But I'm excited now we've been able to use CRISPR. We've made knockout voles. These are uh, published pictures of knockout voles. Um, but we also have oxytocin receptor Cree voles. So now we will be able to do all the cool, fancy stuff um, with cell type specific manipulations. And I'll tell you about that next time I come. I'm going to skip this because I want to make sure we get through all this. And um, So um, one of my grad students was interested in what's going on in the, what is oxytocin doing in the brain in terms of communicating across, communication across these different brain areas? Because you got to, you know, we, we started thinking about this pair bonding and, you know, that social information comes in through the olfactory bulb and then it's got to go to the amygdala and then it's sent, you know, it's like sending all this information across different brain areas in what we call a social salience network. So what he did was wanted to see 
if you block oxytocin receptors, how does that affect activation of these different brain areas? So we did this experiment. You either gave them OT antagonist or CSF and allowed them to mate. And then we took their brains and did FOSS immunocytochemistry. And uh, we were surprised that if we blocked the oxytocin receptors, it did not prevent any area from being activated by mating. Mating activates a lot of brain areas powerfully in males, uh, whether you have oxytocin receptor going or not. But what we found is that if you look at the relationship of that activity across different brain areas, oxytocin seems to be playing a role. So this is a heat matrix that shows you the correlation of um, across animals in the activation of the medial amygdala and the BLA. This is not correlated. So if they're red, the two areas are highly coordinated. Think of it as like, FM, like functional connectivity. Okay? Not really, but almost. This is an animal sitting by itself. If an animal mates and it has oxytocin receptor going, then all of the areas become highly coordinated in their activity. If they mate, but you block oxytocin receptors, they're not correlated. Okay? So to me, this suggests that oxytocin is like the grease of the social brain. It allows the information to flow from area to area to area. And as it goes through these different areas, it does different things. It gets valence in the BLA. In the hippocampus, maybe it stores the identity. In the nu nucleus accumbens, it gets associated with reward. And that is what's happening during the, the pair bond formation. That also seems like something that would be very useful to be able to do in somebody that has a disorder like autism, who they don't process social information correctly. And I'll, talk, I'll bring that back up at the end. Um, yeah, this is a figure from that paper where we talk about you know, the idea that in, somewhere in the brain there are engrams, that, uh, groups of cells that represent the identity of other individuals that you know or that the voles know. And uh, so you might, this may be the engram of the partner. This is a different engram of somebody else. Um, and you know, when they see their partner again, they have that same collection of cells light up. And I think basically the pair bond is a result of neuroplasticity that links the neural encoding of the partner cues with the brain's reward system so that the partner becomes inherently rewarding. And I'll talk more about that later, but uh, we have some evidence. Well, this is what I think is going on. This is the model that we're now collecting electrophysiological data on. But when an animal meets another animal and they sniff it, the, like the hippocampus and the, uh, the BLA, you know, send some information to the nucleus accumbens, direct projections there. But what happens when they mate? So there, with mating, you get um, the VTA releases dopamine, the PVN releases oxytocin. They're all acting in the nucleus accumbens, and somehow you get synaptic plasticity so that the specific projections that which correspond to the encoding of the partner, increase their synaptic strength in the nucleus accumbens, and therefore the partner becomes inherently rewarding. And I think that is the neural circuit basis of pair bonding. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some different variations of this story. One of my students, Katie Barrett, was interested in how early life experience might affect later life bonding and relationships. And she did this paradigm uh, where she took these pups and for three hours a day, for two hours, let's see, three hours a day for two weeks, first two weeks of life, she would take them and put them in these little social isolation chambers. So they were warm, they were in an incubator, but they just were not touching each other, and are not their parents or each other. And for, this was only for the first two weeks of life. And then as they became adults, she tested whether they could form bonds or not. Um, and what she found was that if you just looked at the group as a whole, the control animals that were not socially isolated spend much more time with the partner than the stranger, but the ones who had this early life separation, there was a blunting of that partner preference, right? So the early life, lack of social, or we call it neglect, it's like a model of neglect. If they experience that when they become adults, they don't form bonds as easily. How do they eat? Well, it's only for three hours, so they didn't eat during that time. It's three hours per day, so, right. A little separation. But when they came back, their moms were really happy to see them. Okay? So they got lots of licking and grooming. And then they, they ate. Um, but I'll tell you why that's important in just a minute. Um, 
if you look at the, these, you, you, you might think, well, they, they, look, they look like they have a partner preference, but it's just not statistically significant. And re really, if you look at the individuals, you see that some animals form partner preferences and some didn't. So you can think of this as, you know, now you're producing some animals that are, are basically susceptible to this early life neglect and some that are re resilient. And it turns out, within prairie voles, just like in people that I showed you in that transcriptome, there's a lot of individual variation in how much oxytocin receptor is in the nucleus accumbens. If you look at other areas, the BLA and the central amygdala, the VMH, the cortex, they're basically identical between different voles, different prairie voles. But within the nucleus accumbens, there's a huge amount of individual variation in how much receptor is there. And that determines whether how early life experience shapes the later life pair bonding. So um, this is in that Nature Reviews neuroscience um, paper. It cites the original paper, but um, if the animals, these guys that have the low receptor density, if they experience the neglect, they don't form bonds at all. The animals that have the high receptor density are totally resilient to this. Okay? So it's not that the, social, that the isolation is changing the receptor density. The animals are born with different levels of receptor density. And if they have the high receptor density, they're fine. If they have the low receptor density, they're susceptible. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, this, was, this is all in females, and, but that's because the males in this study did not form partner preferences in the time, the time that we did it. So I, I can't really say what is the sex difference, but um, there was some, because females part, form partner preferences easier than males in this particular study, our males just was not informative. But, so, so um, what does this mean? So I think that this means that Oxytocin is released, oxytocin signaling is released and is able to buffer these animals from this neglect. And what we notice is that when the babies come back with their mom, the mom and dad are happy to see them, they lick and groom them, and we think that this causes oxytocin release, and the animals with the high densities of receptors get more signal from that than the animals with the low receptor density. And uh, we, we know that if you, if you take the pups and you, do, you stroke them like a mother would lick them, it does cause activation of oxytocin neurons. Uh, yep. It, no, it, it, is, it is released from axons, most likely, that are going into the, into the brain areas. Yeah. There's a distinction between, so systemic, I, would think, I think systemic oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary into the blood. That does not get back in. There's a blood-brain barrier. Right, so there's, but the same, the, same neurons, the same neurons also send projections into the brain. Not synaptic. Paracrine, yeah, within the brain. Um, this is a study, so, so that suggests that, you know, like parental nurturing causes oxytocin release, and then that can shape how the brain, you know, the social brain later in life. And we, we, there's evidence that this may be happening in people as well. This is a study done in Israel by Ruth Feldman's group where they took men, fathers who, who had around six-month-old babies and brought them into the laboratory. And then they told the fathers to uh, play with their babies however they wanted to. And they quantified like eye-to-eye -eye contact and reciprocal interactions and stuff. And they gave the fathers either oxytocin or placebo. And what they found is that they gave the fathers oxytocin intranasally. So intranasally, some of it could get into the brain. Uh, the fathers engaged with the child more, had more eye-to-eye -eye contact and more reciprocal interaction. Then they took salivary oxytocin levels from the father and the baby. And not surprisingly, the father who got placebo had relatively low levels of oxytocin in their saliva. If you sniff a bunch of oxytocin, some gets into the saliva and you have high levels. But what they was really amazed at was that if you look at the baby whose father got placebo, relatively low levels, the baby of the father who got oxytocin has a spike in oxytocin levels. And that's probably because the father was engaging with the baby more and the baby was releasing oxytocin. So parental engagement um, can activate this oxytocin system even in humans. And so if what's happening in the voles is true in humans as well, then you can see how early parenting over time accumulate can, can have a cumulative effect on the development of, of social brains. Now, I just wanted to mention this because um, 
this difference in receptor distribution that's specific for the striatum that's not in these other areas comes down to SNPs in the oxytocin receptor. I can genotype animals and tell you whether they'll be high or low. And uh, so one of my projects now is to try to identify how do you get changes in SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that then changes expression patterns in a brain region specific manner. So we're looking at chromatin structure with ChIP-seq and ATAC-seq and trying to understand how SNPs can give rise to this different level of expression. But this is a cool example of how you get a genetic polymorphism that creates differences in brain function that then changes how your environment can influence your social behavior. So, pretty cool system. So, voles not only form pair bonds, but they also seem to have uh, some other kinds of pro-social behaviors. So, uh, this is a collaboration with um, Franz De Waal and done by uh, James Burkett, who now got a faculty position. But we thought, okay, these voles live in, in partnerships. You know, from a male's perspective, his female is um, usually all, almost always pregnant, right? And, uh, and raising offspring at the same time. So uh, we thought that if the, uh, if the partner was distressed, that males should have some mechanism of detecting that distress and alleviating that distress. So um, kind of like empathy. So um, I'm just going to quickly go through this, but we devised this uh, test where we could say, uh, put the animals together, and um, this could be siblings or it could be their partners, and then we would, if this, let's say that these are partners, and we, we would take the female out and either give her some time off away from the partner or put them in a chamber where they would get light foot shocks and a tone to basically stress them out, like a day at work or something like that. And then we would put them back together and see how they would interact with each other. And um, actually, I took the video out. Okay, yeah, so what, basically what we found is that when the, um, if the animals came back stressed, the partner would sniff them and then spend a lot of time grooming them. Okay, so there would be a big increase in the amount of grooming if the partner had just been stressed out. And that grooming would actually uh, reduce the anxiety of the partner. And males did it to their female partners, females did it to their male partners, they would do it to their siblings, but they would not do it to a stranger. So they had to know the other individual. So this is not just a response to, a simple response to a pheromone. It is they have to know the other individual and somehow they can detect that they are distressed and then they, they don't just detect it, but they do something about it. We call it consoling behavior. Metal voles don't do it. They could care less. Metal voles just absolutely don't care if their partner is stressed out. Okay? So that means there's something different in the brains between these two that cause them to do that. And you know, I think that the first kind of empathy response, the original empathy response, is maternal behavior. right? In, in all species, mothers have to detect when the baby is stressed, and then they go do something to alleviate that stress. So that suggested that oxytocin might be involved in this. So we, 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 we found that if we block oxytocin receptors in these voles, they no longer became stressed out when their partner became stressed. So somehow oxytocin signaling is important for that. Um, and then we wanted to know where in the brain that oxytocin is acting in. We did a FOSS experiment to see what parts of the brain were activated when the animal could see the partner when it was returned and was stressed, but they, they couldn't uh, interact with them, but they could see them. And we found that several areas lit up, one of which was the anterior cingulate cortex. And in humans, the anterior cingulate cortex is lit up when you see someone else experiencing pain, like being stabbed in the hand. Um, so we thought maybe Let's, let's see if that was involved. So this is the anterior cingulate cortex. We found if we block the anterior cingulate cortex oxytocin receptors, we also block this consoling behavior. Um, so the voles are engaging in these behaviors that seem to be very similar to our own. It raises the question, you know, can you learn about our own behavior by studying these voles? I'll get back to that in just a minute. I'll talk, I'm just talk briefly about this other set of studies that's um, relevant to bonding, but it's a little bit different from falling in love, but it's what happens when you're already bonded for a long time and then you lose your partner. So we know that when people lose their partner, a long-term partner, there's an increase in mortality, right? Increase in cardiovascular disease, 
decrease in immune function. You probably all know someone that have been married for a long time. One of them dies, and then within a few months, the other one dies. Okay. Um, the, uh, we did this test. We wanted to see if voles experienced that. So we took animals, and we paired them with their, a female, males paired with a female, or males paired with their siblings. Um, for They were five days together, five days together. That means these animals mated and formed bonds. And then we either let them stay together with their partner, or we took the partner away. For the males that were with their siblings, they either stayed with their brother, or they were the brother was taken away. And then we did behavioral tests that are relevant to depressive-like behavior. We did the force swim test and the tail suspension test. Force swim test, you put the animal in a beaker of water, and you see how much time it struggles versus how much time does it just float. Okay? Floating is indicative of passive coping or depressive-like behavior. And what you can see down here is that if the animal was pair bonded and they still were with their brother, with their partner, uh, this is the amount of time just floating. This is immobile. Uh, they spend very little time just floating, but if you take their partner away and then put them in the beaker of water, they just float. Okay? Same thing if you tail suspension test, hold them up by their tail. If they are with their, still with their partner and you hold them up, they spend most of their time going out, uh, trying to get up. If you've taken the partner away five days ago, then you hold them up by their tail, they just hang there. So being without the partner makes them have this depressive like behavior. Does not do that if they're away from their siblings. So it's not social isolation. It is being away from the partner. We showed that the animals that have lost their partner, their adrenal glands are larger. There's an increase in the court axis. And we know that CRF is involved in this process. I'm going to skip over just to make the important point that if we replace the partner with drips of oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens, the animals are not depressed. They don't show the depressive behavior. So this is the vehicle. This is the animal that got, instead of the partner, uh, they got uh, infusion of oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens. Okay? So this suggests that what happens when they're away from their partner is that there's a lack of oxytocin, and that creates a withdrawal kind of effect. So this is very much like addiction again, except a different part of the addiction. But I think of, of, of pair bonding, there's sort of a yin and yang of bonding. There's the one part that I talked about in the beginning of the talk, which is linking of the, uh, of the cues of the partner with the reward system. And that's where you have oxytocin and dopamine interacting together, uh, making that association between the reward and the partner, so the partner becomes inherently rewarding. But then what keeps that together? Anybody who's been, has anybody been in a relationship more than, more than 10 years? So relationships change. In the beginning of a relationship, is very much like that uh, formation of the bond. It's kind of like taking cocaine, right? Being addicted to cocaine. All you can think about is your partner, right? But then things change over time. I remember I've been married for 14 years now. When I first got married, my wife and I got a dog. And every day when I would come home from work, my wife and my dog would be equally excited to see me. <laughs> now... I come home from work, and my dog is still excited to see me. But my wife is saying, when are you coming home? You know, she wants me to come home. Um, so actually, so there's another part, and that's the negative effect that occurs when you're away from the partner. So for those voles, they have to go off every day and forage for food. Well, why don't they just keep on going? They, something has to draw them back to the nest, and that is the negative effect. Just like a junkie who is taking cocaine or heroin, they come back to the cocaine and heroin not because they like the cocaine or heroin, but because they feel the negative affect of being without it. It's the withdrawal. So there's sort of a yin and yang. There's the positive aspect that helps form the bond, and then there's this negative aspect of, that keeps the bond together, which is the negative affect of being away from the partner. Okay, I want to skip this. So um, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, I'm going to talk about what Evidence suggests that oxytocin may be playing a similar role in humans. This is a study done by Hasse Wallam, who was a postdoc in my lab, but at the time he was a grad student in Sweden, Stockholm. And he did a study, we're looking at humans in relationships, and uh, looked at genetic polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptor, like the one I showed you in the bowl, and found that, uh, in fact, variation in the oxytocin receptor gene in people predicted some aspects of pair bonding behavior relationship quality 
in people. That's sort of a gene association study. This is another study that I think is really parallels what's happening in voles. This is a picture. So this right here is me and my wife when we got married so many years ago. And this is my wife about today. And I'm showing you this because this is a study done by a group of Germans who um, took men who were in monogamous relationships and then they took pictures of their partner or other women that a bunch of college students rated to be equally attractive as their partner, right? And then they told the, the men to look at their pictures and rate how pretty the person and how attractive the person in the picture was from one to ten. And then they gave the men either placebo or oxytocin before that. And so a man might, you know, you get oxytocin, uh, so get placebo, looked at a picture of his wife, and he might say, my wife, she's a seven. Seven, pretty good. Um, but uh, if, he got, if he got oxytocin, he would rank her as an eight or a nine. Okay? So oxytocin made him perceive and rate his partner as being more attractive. Uh, but he did not, it did not make him rate other women more attractive. So in other words, women didn't become more attractive. The partner became more attractive. The cool thing about this study is that they did it in a brain scanner so they could see what parts of the brain were activated specifically when they got oxytocin and they saw their partner. And what they found was that these two little spots lit up consistently. And these two little spots are exactly the brain areas that I've been talking about in voles where oxytocin is acting to create a bond. So this suggests that, you know, at least in, for, in humans, you know, seeing the visual stimuli of the partner activates this reward system where oxytocin receptors are. And maybe that's helping to create that kind of bond. This is nasal, intranasal. So there's lots of studies now with intranasal oxytocin. It's a little bit controversial. I can talk about that later. But um, one of the common things that it does is increase the amount of time looking into the eyes. It seems to draw attention to faces and eyes. And um, so uh, studies suggest increase the eye gaze, face, face recognition attraction to a partner, and also a number of studies now suggesting that it might be useful in improving social functioning in autism. I want to come back to a question that I asked Julie, and that is, this study that you just showed us, the stemming, but a lot of the role experiments are actually focused on you know, local... Well, they, so the original vol studies were also systemic, systemic. right? So you, you get... Right, well, the ICV. Um, yeah, and that's because, you know, you always go from the easiest. To, let's see if there's an effect of oxytocin, and then where is it? And, and we can do it that way, yeah. So, but what's the distinction of systemic versus systemic? What are the brain The distinction is that oxytocin will be doing different things in different brain areas, so that if you do a, a, a local infusion, you can isolate the effect of what it's doing in that area. So oxytocin may also, oxytocin increases aggression. Right? right, If you have a mom and there's a, uh, an intruder that comes, she is very aggressive. Right? So, but that's acting in the amygdala. Right? So it's acting in different things. Um, so yeah, I would agree that it would be ideal if we did all these studies in humans with site-specific, but we can't. So you, you have to realize, so oxytocin may be doing different things in different brain areas, um, but we can't manipulate it in people like that. The same to yeah, put all drugs. Well, um, actually, let me finish my. There's the heart. Is one place. The, the, the uh, reproductive, the, like the vas deferens and the smooth muscles of the reproductive system. Um, but yeah, so this is absolutely true. So you, you're sniffing it, you're hitting it all, all over the body. So um, you're hitting the vagal nerve. So to, it's not clear to me, I don't want to get into that controversy right now, but it's not clear to me that the intranasal oxytocin studies are showing you effects of oxytocin acting in the brain. Okay. But anyway, it does suggest what we do see from both the animal and the humans is that probably what oxytocin is doing is enhancing the salience of social stimuli and the reinforcing value of social stimuli. But we have a limited way of manipulating that in people. Okay. Um, I want to skip a couple of slides because it's time to finish here and just say that you know we, we have done studies in humans where we give you know, different doses of 
of oxytocin and shown that indeed we could also show that it increases the amount of time looking at faces um, and looking into the eyes and um, this is uh, fMRI uh, data showing that uh, if you compare people with autism versus not with autism, so these are um, healthy controls versus people with autism, there's more connectivity between areas like that are involved in salience and visual stimuli. So it's connecting areas that are involved in, in salience with visual processing. Um, and oxytocin does that same thing. So it makes people with autism have more of a connection with those areas. Um, so uh, this is just sort of a teaser. A lot of these papers are just going to be coming out now. But I want to make the point, just the last point, is that even though there are studies that suggest that oxytocin may be useful in treating people with autism, there are many other studies that don't replicate that. Uh, many of the intranasal oxytocin studies fail to replicate because the effect sizes are very small. And uh, this is one study from uh, a group in Australia uh, where they looked at uh, uh, social responsiveness scores in autism, and the red dots are the individuals that got oxytocin. So here they took kids three to eight years of age and gave them intranasal oxytocin in the morning and in the evening. Um, and it showed some little shift in this score. But to me, most of the studies that are doing this in, in autism don't make any sense at all. Because if you imagine that what oxytocin does is increases the salience of social stimuli for about an hour after you, they take it. So you give your kid, you say, here, I'm going to heighten up your social, you know, your sensitivity to social stimuli, and I go get on the bus with a bunch of other kids who, they're not all going to give you positive social vibes, right? A lot of negative things are going on. So it doesn't even make sense that that would work, right? Oxytocin is not like a vitamin that people have a low level of and they're just not getting enough. Uh, so I think the, the way that the oxytocin should be used uh, is to combine it with some sort of behavioral therapy. So if the child, within that hour after they get it, they can have increased salience of social stimuli, they pay more attention, uh, that it would be useful. Um, but still in reality, you know, if you look at any other drug that's used in psychiatry, there is no other drug that's commonly used in psychiatry that is the same molecule as the body makes. We don't give people serotonin who are depressed, right? So oxy intranasal oxytocin is the first generation of kind of uh, approach to see if this system is a useful target. Now that it is, we need to develop other drugs that can go in to increase the brain levels. So we've been doing the same, this kind of approach where we look at oxytocin neurons and say, you know, what if we could stimulate oxytocin release from the oxytocin neurons in the brain? Um, and it turns out there are, uh, you know, are, are there drugs that bind to receptors on oxytocin neurons that could be used to evoke endogenous release? And um, there are a couple of examples of that. I'll just show you one, which is a melanocortin agonist. If you take uh, this drug, it passes the blood-brain barrier. It's called melanotan-2. It causes release of oxytocin within the brain. It causes other things, too. It's like any drug is dirty. But uh, we can take it and give it to voles and induce a, a partner preference. And, um, and once this is learned, even if we give it to the animals and they don't mate, but they experience this drug so they get oxytocin release, uh, then we separate them for a week so all the drug is gone. And then we test them on the partner preference. They still have a partner preference. So that means that the social information that they learned under the influence of this drug is retained even though the drug is gone. So, you know, I think that this kind of approach is, would be useful for teaching social skills that then, even when the, um, the drug is not around, you still have those skills. So, um, I don't think that intranasal oxytocin is the answer, but it's a clue that tells us that the oxytocin system is a system that we would want to target pharmacologically, but we got, need to figure out how to target it pharmacologically, and then you don't need to give it like a vitamin but you give it in a very controlled kind of setting so that a child with autism, you know, I think of it as that those children have their, um, the window to their social world is frosted over. They don't get that social information coming through. But if you give them oxytocin that helps the flow of information across the different brain areas more efficiently, then they may be able to process that information and the behavioral therapy, which works, will become even more effective. So I will stop there.
project your uh, partner has a female, how they Two females they fight. The two females will fight. They will not let. So mice, you know, mice are okay with that. <clears throat> you mean if you put them in a cage with two females at the same time? Well, I mean, in reality, what will happen is those two females will fight, and then one of them will die. Um, so, but it, maybe this will get at your question. So, in nature, a, ne a male never has two females at the same time with him. Voles? No, I don't think so. Okay, so, right for mice, it's this, for mice, it's okay. They don't form any bonds. Nobody's forming bonds. I thought you were asking me about voles. Uh -huh. He will not form bonds because he doesn't have oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. Mice do not have any, do not have the oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. So everything that I told you does not apply to mice, except for you know it it, it does involve in the in in mice being able to remember another mouse. If you don't have oxytocin receptors, mice can't tell my other mice apart. Right. They, So this is one of the things that I skipped. So in the visual system, we don't know in, in rodents at all. We know in the auditory cortex, uh, mothers uh, who, um, when their pups are taken away, pups call ultrasonic vocalization. And the auditory cortex is loaded with oxytocin receptors, and it makes, oxytocin makes the auditory cortex more sensitive to pup calls. Okay, And that activates maternal behavior. So again, it's that increase in signal to noise. There's a paper in Nature. Um, from Robert Frumke's group showing that oxytocin acts in the auditory cortex to make pup calls more salient and therefore the mothers respond. For, for visual cortex in rodents probably it's not that important but um, yeah this is the slide. So if you look on the left side rodents are very olfactory and all of the areas that process olfactory information are loaded with oxytocin receptors. They may be different in different species but still, olfactory bulb is very common. Um, like voles have prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens. Mice have very little there. But if you look in primates, we tell each other apart by faces and sounds. If you look at where the receptors are in primates, they're in areas that are involved in visual processing and eye movements and things like that. So it's incredible. They, receptors are doing generally the same thing. They're making social stimuli more salient. But how they do it is different in different species they use different modalities. So to question, answer your question, I think in primates, it's re involved in visual, not in rodents. OK, maybe new person. Yeah, OK. Uh, I still don't understand your global idea, but uh, two cell embryos really, really So two will be opposing in the field, you know, there you get uh, different functional parties, and together, Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're, we're sort of moving in that direction very slowly, uh, as you are, but, uh, you know, we started out with very simple, what molecules are involved, and then what brain areas are involved, and then, uh, you know, what receptors are involved, what cell types are they involved. And now we can uh, do manipulations and observations of groups of specific kinds of cells, like oxytocin receptor cells, and I think it's just going to be either recording you know, with electrodes that have many, many contacts in multiple brain areas at the same time. We have done some of that. I didn't talk about it here, but recording from the prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens at the same time and seeing how that oxytocin may be affecting the way these two areas communicate with each other. Um, I think you start 
expanding that to more and more brain areas. We have a, one grant now that's supposed to, we're supposed to record from the BLA, prefrontal cortex, and nucleus accumbens all at the same time and see how the interaction of those things are affecting. So as that gets more and more complicated, I think we get a better and better circuit level view of how things work. So you and then you. No, not not the nucleus accumbens, oxytocin receptors does not seem to be. Is that the features? Like it's, a phenotype. Yeah, it's a phenotype. So I'm more resilient. I have more receptors. Right. They're not going to downregulate in the presence of having a bad mom. Right. Not these, but um, Michael Meany and um, Francis Champagne. Uh, they they have this story of, of of oxytocin receptors in the medial preoptic area, and that the licking and grooming that a pup gets. Uh, changes those oxytocin receptors in the medial preoptic area and then changes the way that pup is a mother. So there may be some aspects of the system that are experience dependent, but the one I talked about it seems to be much more genetic. So it's probably one more question, I think, than that. So there's two possible explanations that people talk about, and I don't know which one is which, but uh, they both make sense. And one is uh, has to do with um, population density and finding a partner. So these animals, uh, a male, females don't cycle. So a male will never come across a female who's an estrus. He comes across a female, and then he has to court her for a couple days. And the urine of the male stimulates the HPG axis in the female so that she then becomes pregnant. But that only works if the female is not already pregnant. So under low population density, there's little chances of a male coming across a female who's not already pregnant, who he can make, you know, get into estrus, and then he can fertilize her. So because of the low population density that happens in these prairies, uh, males that stick with the female will be certain that every 21 days we'll have a mate. Okay? But only in the wild, 60% of males form these bonds, 40% don't. So even in prairie voles, there's a lot of variation. The other scenario has to do with predators. If there are weasels in the environment that eats babies, if you're a male who says, I'm going to have as many females as possible, have as many babies as possible, that's the game, have as many babies as possible, he may have 100 females that all have babies, but if all those females have to go forage for food, leave the nest unattended, none of those babies will be surviving. And the animal who stays with the female and they take turns, so this is, it takes two to raise a family, um, then that um, the, the male, he'll have many fewer babies, but they will survive. So that's the two scenarios, and we don't know which, which is the case. Um, but anyway, sequencing the genome, I don't think that sequencing the genome and identifying 100,000 SNPs is going to get you any closer to the biology behind this. Right. Why, why? Because, um, so I know, I, but my student comes in and says, here's 100,000 SNPs. There, you know, in every chromosome, there's 100,000 SNPs. And I would say, then, which one is important? And then, well, I would say a GWAS with 100 people is already out the window. So a, a GWAS with 100,000 people is not out the window. So if your question is, I have, if I took 100,000 voles and I knew the behavioral phenotype of them, maybe I'll do GWAS on those. But just sequencing the two species, I don't think it's going to get to the answer because there's, there, I know that even with the oxytocin receptor, we, we sequenced about 70 voles and there's like 1,000 SNPs just within prairie voles in the oxytocin receptor. And 
Yeah. yeah. So, and if you expand that across the entire genome, I can see a list of, you know, 99.9999% of them will have no effect on. Except the SNPs that I have within the species, I know that those are affecting behavior or that are affecting expression. Then if I got, had my list of 100,000 SNPs, I wouldn't know that any of them had anything to do with any kind of brain physiology. That's the difference. Those, those SNPs I've already identified are affecting expression. So I think it's time should go.